Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a great conversation on TAP today, finding and providing clarity amidst the array of digital learning definitions. This webinar is hosted in partnership with Minerva. My name is Megan Raymond, and I lead programs, events, sponsorship, and membership here at WCEP. So thank you for being on this webcast. If this is your first webcast with us, do check out our website and learn more about the work that we do. The webcast is being recorded and we will send out a link to the recording as well as share any resources that were mentioned during the webcast. Now I'd like to go ahead and pass it off to Russ Poulin, who's going to be the moderator for today's conversation and is the executive director of WCET. Welcome, Russ. Thank you, yes. And thank you, Kim and Megan, for getting, getting this going. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, WCT has long been in these discussions about uh, what we do about the definitions and how and, and how do we work with them to best support students as we as we uh, go forward. And and we'll highlight a lot of the work that has been done uh, in the past year by WCT. And just you know, very pleased to have uh, Minerva with us here today. So let's uh, go ahead and get to our uh, our discussions today. Our panelists today and let them introduce themselves. And so, uh, James, let me start with you. Hi, everyone. And first, uh, thanks very much, Russ, and everyone at WCET uh, for hosting this panel. We're very glad to be collaborating with you on it. I'm James Janon. I'm the Vice President of Academic Solutions and Innovation at Minerva Project, and also a professor of social sciences at Minerva University, which is the university that Minerva Project founded uh, back in 2012, and which is now fully independent, accredited, nonprofit university. And uh, my background is in teaching and learning, curriculum development, and I've been working at Minerva Project for the last five years with our partners globally on developing new hybrid interdisciplinary programs. Excellent, James. Welcome, and thank you for your support today. And so, uh, Catherine, let me go to you. Thanks, Russ. Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Kerensky. I'm the Director of Digital Learning Policy and Compliance for the State Authorization Network, or SAN which is a division of WCET. The State Authorization Network is a national organization of more than 800 institutions and agencies, uh, and our mission is to empower members to successfully resolve post-secondary educational technology regulatory challenges, and to stay apprised of timely issues which touch out-of-state activities in, in digital learning. My background is in uh, distance education regulatory compliance. Uh, I did that work at a university uh, for seven years before joining SAN in 2021. Excellent, thank you, Catherine. And uh, Shannon, who uh, was our our um, leader for our for our steering committee, uh, welcome to you. And it's a person I don't think you ever sleep, Shannon, because it just gets so much done. But I'll let you introduce yourself. <laughs> yes, hi everyone. My name is Shannon Riggs. I currently serve as executive director of academic programs and learning innovation for Oregon State University's eCampus. We offer um, over 100 fully online programs at the undergrad and graduate level, um, and have been in um, offering distance education programs for over 20 years. Uh, and as Russ mentioned, I'm, I'm currently serving on the WCET steering committee, so thanks for having me. Excellent. And, and Shannon, while you're up, let's have you go ahead and talk about some of the things that the uh, steering committee worked on for this last year. Sure. Over the last year, we were really interested um, Kind of emerging from um, all of the changes that happened during the, the pandemic um, and all of the different kinds of modalities that were being offered across our institutions, we were really interested just to kind of track what was what exactly was happening and how we're redefining all of the different modality terminologies that, that we were using. Um, and so the, the steering committee um, kind of initiated a, um, a study um, and it was a replication of a study that was conducted by the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association. Um, and so we repeated that study. And uh, Nicole Johnson um, from, um, from that organization, Jeff Seaman, who's the director of Bayview Analytics, and our very own Russ um, uh, participated in, in kind of re, um, reconducting that, that same study. Now it's distributed by um, four different online education and um, um, higher education organizations, WCET, OLC, Quality Matters, and APSEA. They help to distribute the survey to their members. And then the, 
the write-up of the study was published in the online learning journal under um, a Creative Commons license. So the survey asked institutions or, or, or you know, the, the respondents if they had a single institution-wide definition for online, remote, distance, and hybrid learning, and then pose definitions of each modality and ask the degree to which the respondents agreed or, or disagreed with, with each definition. So what we found was that there was more agreement about the definitions than we had anticipated. Um, so uh, when we counted the agree to strongly agree responses, uh, we had about 92% that agreed what in-person learning meant, 91% um, agreed what hybrid meant, and about 95% agreed what online meant. There was a little less agreement for newer high flex mo modality, um, which makes sense because it was, you know, relatively, relatively new. So despite all of that agreement, which was a surprise to us, when we asked um, institutions for hybrid, uh, hybrid learning modalities, did they have a single institution-wide definition? 52% said that they did. 31% re reported that they had various definitions across their institution for what hybrid was. And 12% reported both. They had a, both a single and uh, varying definitions. Same, very, very similar for online, 62% said there was a single definition. Um, I'm sorry, that says hybrid, that should say online there. 27% reported varying and 9% reported, reported both. So um, kind of mixed results. <laughs> so our takeaway there is really that just because we could, um, as a community, recognize the definitions and understand what they meant, it doesn't necessarily mean we're using those that terminology consistently. Um, in our institutions with our faculty, staff, and students. And so we wondered as a steering committee, if we're not using those terms consistently, what is the impact on students? So here I will turn it over to Russ to talk about the next part of um, the, the work that was done. Excellent, yeah, and you'll see uh, the theme throughout this that we wanted to get the uh, different points of view. So we have faculty and administrators in that survey. We wanted to hear from uh, students and that's what's here. You'll see a little bit later on that we wanted to hear about the policy and what's 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 going on uh, from that. Before I before I move on, I do want to remind people: if you do have questions, you know, please use the Q and A, and we do plan to get to the, your your questions at the end. And we do encourage questions, so please ask them there. So uh, our good friends uh, Rob Griffiths and our friends at uh, Ohio State University uh, have their uh, design thinking team, and that they're very helpful for us in terms of. Uh, setting up a focus group and then we worked with uh, people and got, and got uh, folks from a variety of different types of institutions, got undergraduates and graduate institutions. It was a small number of students, but uh, um, and they went from coast to coast and so uh, wanted to get uh, uh, different types of uh, feedback about, about this. And uh, we asked them less about uh, definitions and more about their, their experience in this, although we did get into definitions a bit. And so if we move to the next slide, that we'll see some of the things that came out of this and that there was a, a blog post that was put out in December that talks about really the uh, some of the di different areas, the uh, different findings that we found when we uh, 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 get this down to the, the, the finer points of what they said. And really that this is that that I've really come up with that out of those that are uh, three that this year that we're going to want to continue to uh, uh, push forward and 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 these are that at the point of registration that the students really didn't care what you called it what they wanted to know was what was going to be the impact on them they wanted to know what technology or software uh are going to be expected of them and in fact we had one student who got to the course was like a week or two into the course and had to drop it because the choice was between eating and continuing with the course uh so she wouldn't have taken that course if she'd known that uh farther on and it set her back in her studies you know and by regulation uh that you are supposed to say if there's uh, extra costs for proctoring or other sorts of things that are in there and i know everybody on this call is all up to speed on that and have that already 
Uh, a second one is that are there in-person expectations, whether you know whether on campus or or do they have to go somewhere locally for proctoring or be someplace in person? Uh, it gets into this fully online thing. And the other is that if it's not in person, uh, is there uh, requirements for synchronous uh, courses? Do I have to be somewhere at 10 o'clock on Wednesday uh, every week? Uh, we were, I remember years ago, we were working with some um, a program that was going to work for firefighters and they would put a synchronous part into it. Well, firefighters can't always um, guarantee that they're going to be someplace at 10 o'clock because the alarm might go off and they might be off fighting a fire and, you know, as an example with that. So these are three um, that we're, you're going to hear us uh, do more with o over the year and talk about it. And somebody the other day when I presented on this said, well, this is old stuff that we've talked about this for years, but What's really happening is that with the great expansion of uh, online education, hybrid, all the different variations, uh, high flux and everything about it, more and more students are affected and we need to be more and more open about what, what we're doing or what these students will experience. Let's go to the next slide. And there's some other things that they'd like to know. Not necessarily, we say kind of separated out, not necessarily at um, registration, but they would like uh, more information about uh, what are student services and what is the syllabus? Because there's a lot of uh, talk uh, in that, especially on the last one, in terms of what is expected of me in terms of engagement. Because some of it was that they were trying to figure out what do I have to do academically, but also uh, do I have to have video on? And do I have to be in a place where I have to have the video on? And they have to think about that given their own uh, uh, home setting and worries about bandwidth and all those sorts of things. And so they're, they're, you know, they're thinking ahead about what they need to do. So uh, we, we just had uh, conversations with our steering committee and the group and the subgroup of that, the working group that's working on definitions things this year. There's a lot more interest about following up on these and seeing about the student impact and coming up with uh, more research and more recommendations this year. Uh, with that, um, I'm gonna move on and turn to James and, and, and James, you know, you've really been looking at what's been going on, uh, you know, academically and what we can do with all these uh, different uh, different areas. And so I'm going to turn to you uh, to give us what you, you have found with Minerva. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Russ. Uh, over the last, you know, two to three years, we've talked with literally hundreds of institutions who are trying to figure out their, their strategy uh, for the way they use different learning modalities. And I would say, you know, as we got into the second year of the pandemic, institutions that were sort of past the initial phase of reacting to teaching remotely started to think about the future of what they would do beyond the pandemic. And certainly as we've we've moved kind of out of that phase, you know, the conversations are really around two questions. You know, we know that our learners are continue to be interested in some amount of online learning. Um, and of course, there were there were many who were interested in that before the pandemic, but we don't know what to do. We don't know what formats to offer. Um, and second, we, we're not sure what approach to take to technology. And, you know, our answer to this is the first question, you know, it's really about the students. What are the students need? Who are the students that you're trying to serve? And thinking through this intentionally and really coming up with a strategy that's driven by the needs of the students and the learning goals for the students. And then coming to the technology question second, once you've answered the first question, is really the best approach unless you get below that kind of surface layer of reactions that you can have to needing to offer online or hybrid programs. So if you go to the next slide, um, we can look at you know some different uh, principles that we've identified that can really make hybrid learning successful at the institutional level. So the first one, as I've already alluded to, really has to do with thinking about the different student audiences and demographics that you're serving as an institution. And um, in a moment, I'll go into a little bit more depth about how we think about this. But one of the things we do with our partner institutions is to really carefully segment uh, the student audiences that they serve think a lot about their needs, their goals, and also the different disciplinary areas that they're working in, and which kinds of learning modalities or combinations of learning modalities will be most effective for them given those needs. The second thing is that whenever you're making changes to your offerings at the institutional level or within programs or departments, it's a real opportunity to take a look at instructional practices. Um, we found this uh, a lot 
during the pandemic, people tried to bring the same instructional practices that they've been doing, you know, in regular classrooms to virtual spaces, and that didn't go well in a lot of cases. Um, and there's a lot of evidence out there from learning science, which is one of our main areas of focus, that some of the traditional practices around large lectures uh, and, and exams um, you know, aren't the most effective way for students to learn, and that can be even more true um, when delivered online. So, you know, we spent a lot of time with our partners focusing on taking the learning science and incorporating really effective active learning uh, strategies into courses, regardless of what modality they're delivered in. Um, and this kind of comes into the third point where you can create a consistent experience for students in terms of how they learn across the different modalities, um, that can really be a big boon to them. Russ was talking about students wanting to know what the expectations are for them. And what we've seen is that when there's a consistent and coherent approach that institutions take uh, to curriculum, to teaching and learning, and to the implementation of technology, it really helps reduce the friction for students. So they're not having to relearn how to learn every time they take a new course with a different instructor. So again, this is something that we work with uh, our partners on in quite a bit of depth when we're creating new programs for them or kind of thinking about institutional strategy for, for hybrid learning. So if you go to the last slide, um, this just gives you an example or kind of a deeper dive. I won't try to go through every bullet point on here of how we sort of work through a very intentional approach to designing for hybrid learning. So we've we've identified a number of different categories of learning modalities here. Um, there's online learning writ large, but of course that has different subtypes. You know, fully asynchronous courses, fully synchronous courses, and some that are that are blends of the two. So obviously in-person courses, and then for us, you know, hybrid can really happen at the course level at the program level, and of course, also at the, in the institutional level, and, and figuring out which of these modalities to employ for a particular course or program, I think, again, really comes back to what are the use cases for the learners? What do they need? Um, you know, how do their needs change uh, as their lives change? You'll have students who, you know, might be full-time students at, at some point, and for them, more synchronous is really great. They might be quite happy to come onto campus and, and be with other students. And then in other cases, they, they need to work and they need more flexibility um, or they need more self-paced, but they still wanna keep that connection to their peers. So online, but some amount of synchronous is really helpful for them. So by thinking through all of this and looking systematically at how you design the hybrid experience for students, I think you can come up with an offering that's a lot more sophisticated than just having some classes in person and other versions of those same classes online. Let me stop there and, and turn it back to you, Russ. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. This is it's really interesting. I hope people look at the, the resources that you uh, shared out today. And then uh, with that, that we'll uh, going on and we're getting into the, the policy realm, you know, and then so so when when people are looking at this what, you know, how are they how are they defining it how does that affect us and so uh catherine's done some uh in-depth analysis for us in this and i'll turn it to you to talk about what you found thank you catherine thanks russ i'm happy to speak a bit today to the policy view of distance education definitions um i will point to the report that um is referenced on this slide but first i'd like to to speak a bit to the context so we can all understand the scope and pot potential impact from a policy and compliance perspective before reviewing the work that we've done on the topic. So I'm sure we're all aware that higher education is highly regulated. Institutions have to navigate requirements from the state and federal level, in addition to guidelines from accreditors and just their own internal policies and procedures. So with that, every agency can utilize a, a different definition for the same concept of different uh, of distance education. And that presents complications when it comes to developing policies, procedures, or just guidelines to ensure that you understand the requirements and compliance with each entity to which an institution may owe an obligation. And this could be even more the case for institutions offering distance education outside of the institution's home state. Um, compliance obligations increase due to the responsibility institutions have to follow state laws where the activity takes place and states can really vary widely in terms of those responsibilities. And, and having all these different responsibilities really presents compliance challenges and risks as noncompliance could put institutions at risk of a variety of consequences from a number of agencies, 
including loss of access to financial aid, repayment of student aid, accreditor sanctions, and more. Uh, so as you can see referenced on the slide, WCT and SAN have conducted an analysis of distance education definitions used by federal agencies, states, accreditors, and others uh, to really highlight the challenges and risks associated with navigating these multiple sources of definitions and policy. In summary, we found a variety of definitions used for a variety of purposes. Multiple definitions may exist within the same organization or institution. And although the reason for differences in policy may not always be clear, it's important to note um, policies may, de may be developed by um, a constituency or organization with a, a different perspective. And it's just important to note where policy interpretations can differ. So if we go to the next slide, I'll take a few minutes here to talk about our findings in a bit more detail. Um, a theme that consistently came through in many definitions we reviewed um, is the emphasis on physical separation of student and instructor. And although many entities agree with that theme, the primary variation that we observe related to the specificity of percentages of coursework or instruction that would constitute distance education. So you can see on this slide, on this slide, it's the um, a graphic that's detailing the variation in courses. So at one extreme. Um, you have, you know, the in whole or in part definition, that's a very low extreme. And um, you can see here the American Bar Association at 33%. Um, they define distance education course as one of which the students are separated from the faculty member for more than one third of the instruction. So that's where we came up with the 33%. And for purposes of SACS, um, it's in a case where the majority of the instruction occurs when they're not in the same place. HLC is at 75%. Um, and at the upper extreme is the Department of Veteran Affairs, um, where a course taken solely online must be certified as distance. And for the Department of Homeland Security, um, a course that's offered primarily through technology does not require the student's physical attendance. And, and these definitions have really important implications for students. Um, so for example, the distinction between in residence and distance training by the VA can determine how much housing allowance a student may receive, and for an international student to maintain status, um, immigration status in the United States, only one distance learning class can count toward a full course load. So, um, and for a student to maintain other statuses, they might not be allowed any distance classes. So there really can be a lot of impact on this, and it really depends on which definition you're looking at in which context to understand the impact that it may have on students. And if we go to the next slide, um, not only is the variation in percentages seen in distance education courses, but also in programs. So there's the in whole or in part, which is an accreditation review from the Department of Education. In the middle, you see around 50% the definition from uh, CAPE, the Council for Accreditation of Educator Programs. Um, U.S. News Report is another example of one we looked at. They define that as the vast majority of required coursework. So it's a little more vague in terms of what the vast majority would be. We put that as roughly 75% just for purposes of, of showing this range. And then lastly, at the high end, IPEDS defines a distance education program is one in which all the required coursework for program completion can be completed via distance education. So why are there so many different definitions? If we go, yeah, thank you. Uh, Fundamentally, there are so many different definitions because each definition is crafted by different stakeholders and with different policy rationales. So when you have these many different perspectives, it really makes agreeing on a single definition difficult. And not only that, but some organizations provide multiple definitions or sub-definitions related to distance education. So for example, the Council on Social Work Education provides definitions of distance education generally, but also Underneath that, they define online broadcast site and correspondence as sort of subcategories. And further, as we saw in the last two slides, some organizations provide definitions not only of distance education, um, but of distance education courses in distance education programs. These different interpretations and perspectives present challenges in understanding and commuting, communicating key information, and it's difficult to develop systems or institutional definitions to meet the needs of external stakeholders, and then so like regulators or accreditors and then institutional stakeholders, especially the needs of students. And although the reasons for these policy variations may not always be clear, um, it's important when it comes to understanding policy to be mindful of the interpretation and perspective of the agency that is enforcing the policy. And um, to the point about uh, 
different agencies having different uh, reasons for policy to have different um, definitions of distance education. If we go to the next slide, uh, I had this graphic in here to illustrate how these definitions are used for different purposes, even by the same agency. So uh, Title IV definitions of distance education alone provide three different reference points um, and contain unique elements for institutions to understand and manage. So they're, they're used for different purposes by the Department of Education. You have the, the definition that's used for accreditation uh, review at 668.8M. It requires that programs in whole or in part offered by distance education to be reviewed and accredited by an agency that has distance education within its scope. Then you have the financial aid eligibility where as at 600.2 and it uses regular and substantive interaction to distinguish distance education and correspondence. And this is for purposes of Title IV eligibility, um, which is very critical because the course that's deemed to be correspondence instead of distance education uh, would not be eligible for the same aid. And then at the other end, you have the, for data reporting, um, the IPEDS defines distance education for purposes of reporting exclusively distance education enrollments. So there's three purposes just within one agency, and the thresholds really range from a minimal one for the accreditation review to a very steep range for the IPEDS data reporting. And in the middle, you kind of have regular and substantive interaction, um, which requires meeting a lot of criteria. So how to move forward? Uh, we go to the next slide, thank you. In reviewing other sources of distance education definitions, there was a, a common theme, was a reference back to these statutes that I referenced from uh, the Department of Education or the Higher Education Act. And often this was done by institutional creditors, which isn't really surprising, um, to see that since they often have to model their definitions um, after one or more of the HEA Title IV definitions to maintain status as a department recognized accreditor. But in general, going forward and developing definitions of distance education, any new ones, it would be helpful to review and possibly reference these already existing definitions. Uh, citing and referencing these provisions um, makes sense for clarity. Uh, they have the benefit of synthesizing the definitions and minimizing these variations. So really for any organization considering what definition of distance education to create or adopt, it'd be helpful to review, reference, or adopt an existing definition. Uh, and, and really lastly, for in the institutional perspective, collaboration is really key within the institution. In the case of navigating these definitions, there's multiple institution offices or departments that may came, come into play, including but not limited to instructional designers, faculty, compliance staff, financial aid, accreditation, uh, institutional research, and of course, students as well. So institutions should bring together stakeholders to weigh the risk and priorities, discuss ways that uh, the institution could operationalize and reduce the confusing messages to students. So specifically, as I put on here, institutions really do well to develop clear policies or definitions that they haven't already, ensure policies are clear to all affected, so instructors and students, and just ensure that course descriptions are clear to students. From a compliance management perspective, we talk about having a defensive, defensible process, and that's what institutions want to have here. It's important to document the process and the definitions you use, and beyond that, um, there could be some um, institutions have some flexibility to choose strategies that can best balance the spirit of compliance, institutional efficiency, and transparency. There's obviously a lot more to get to in that report. I'd be happy to ask questions, but for now, I'll turn it back to, to Russ to get us into some more discussion. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And let's get to some some discussions here that we'd like that we'd like to have. And, and excellent. You can see that there's a lot of work and a lot more work to be done uh, in this in this whole area. And so, but one thing I'd like to ask about, you know, that uh, you know we've got all these different modalities and people are um, having trouble defining what the modalities. You know, you know. But, you know, why do the differences in these modalities matter and, and why do the definitions around them matter? And Shannon, I wonder, you know, you work with this across uh, Oregon State University, a large uh, institution. You have lots of uh, online uh, enrollments and things, you know, why do these uh, differences in modalities matter? Well, I mean, to, to begin with, just from a student success perspective, students really need to know what's expected of them and what they need to be prepared. and. Um, you know, where they need to be and when. Um, but beyond that, there are really a lot of financial implications for, for students that can come out of different um, modalities. Um, you know, tuition rates can differ based on, based on the modality. 
for international students, there can be some residency requirements um, that they that they need to meet. Um, and so they need to have those well defined. Um, for veterans who use veteran students who use the GI Bill, their um, military housing allowance can differ substantially based on the modality. I mean, at Oregon State, it's it's over a thousand dollars difference per per month for students who are um, either attending on campus versus versus online. Um, and even for um, students who are parents, you know, the cost of arranging childcare, you know, that can be prohibitive if you're, you know, childcare, there's there's such a just such a limited supply of good childcare in, in many places. Um, and then so that can be a real access issue in terms of number one, whether you can find it or not, and number two, whether you can afford it. Um, and so the, the more flexibility we can offer in those modalities, I think it's um, it's really boils down to an access issue. Excellent, excellent. And James, I'm going to come to you with the same question, but I do want to remind people to go ahead and put questions in the uh, Q and A. And to the one question, yes, we are going to share the uh, the slides and recording to this, and so we'll get to that already. And so, uh, James, what's your take on this? What uh, from your experience, what are you seeing about why these modalities matter? Yeah, I mean, I really agree with what Shannon said. I think it's so important for students, um, the definitions, and to have that clarity. And Catherine was talking about this too, so that they understand the, the expectations of them and what they're getting when they sign up for a class or a program. Um, I would also add, just coming back to a point I made earlier, that um, different modalities offer different kinds of learning opportunities. We work with our partners a lot on highly interdisciplinary programs, some of which have a partially technical or STEM focus. And for that, you know, the kind of hands-on learning you can get in an innovation lab, um, you know, in a, in a science lab is really important and hard to recreate online in many cases. Um, and on the other hand, we found that online, um, particularly synchronous learning, offers opportunities to engage students and collect data about their engagement or give them kinds of feedback that's actually hard to recreate in a physical classroom because of the opportunities that technology affords. So, you know, each modality has its distinctive advantages and you can combine them in really interesting ways that serve students really well if you're thoughtful about it. And so it matters to define what those are and then to map them to the different opportunities that they present. Excellent, excellent. Catherine, what would you like to add from a policy perspective? Honestly, I don't know how much more I could add because I think Shannon and James covered it really well, especially in terms of the implication and the value of the different modalities. One thing I would add just from navigating the confusion array of it is that especially in the report I referenced, we were only reviewing definitions of distance education. So it doesn't account for the fact that there could be policy definitions of hybrid or high flex or, or synchronous or fully online, um, which could just further complicate things more and just really, I think, emphasizes that no matter how you define these modalities, like internally at the institution, it's just really clear to make sure that courses are defined consistently within that structure and that it's very clear to students what they're signing up for um, ultimately. And then you, you know, you kind of work and figure out how that aligns with your compliance responsibilities as well. But ultimately just making sure that you you have a process to, to define them and classify them and follow that and make it clear to students, I think. Excellent, excellent. Well, well, James, you, you've talked about you know, the hybrid transformation for institutions, faculty, students, and how it's affected them all. And then also in the uh, report that uh, Shannon referenced, uh, that uh, within that, the work from Nicole, that she's, she points to that there's really, it's hard to put things in buckets anymore, that it's kind of a spectrum uh, uh, in terms of the use of face-to-face, you know, -face synchronous technologies as you get across. So, you know, have we really moved into a world where it's really hybrid modality is the is the new norm? And and if so, um, what is the impact on that on, on these different audiences? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, we, we wrote a white paper on this back in January, which is available through our website. And I think um, we'll probably be able to make available after the session to to participants. Great. And one of the things that we we talked about there is that, you know, I think for institutions and for institutional strategy, this comes down to access and impact. Um, I think, you know, because of the sort of demographic cliff and, and co competition for scarce enrollments that most institutions are subject to now, they really have 
about how they can serve uh, the, their audiences in, in flexible ways. Um, because if they don't, their competitors will, will be doing that. And um, uh, likewise, you know, people are a lot more savvy than they were uh, five years ago. They've, they've understood now um, the opportunities that new technologies afford and different ways in which you can access learning. So I think that, you know, institutions that are really kind of at the cutting edge of innovation on this front are going through a very systematic process where they look at where are their existing institutional strengths, where do they need to build capacity, and how can they move in the direction of becoming, you know, a truly hybrid institution? Because I think they see it is going to be the new norm. Um, there's going to be very, very few institutions that can be successful by being really narrow in this regard. Some may be able to, but the vast majority, I think, will need to have options for their learners. Excellent. Excellent. Shannon, uh, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, we've talked a lot about students so far, but I think there's um, an angle that needs to be considered, and it's the uh, faculty development and support that's involved. The more we offer digitally, the more support that's needed around, around that uh, for, from the faculty point of view. So, you know, if you're preparing um, a fully online or a hybrid or a blended course, there are materials that need to be developed. There are, you know, for many faculty, new pedagogical approaches that need to be, you know, considered and tried out and, and experimented with. Um, and you know, materials need to be made accessible, of course, for, for students. And all of that requires some faculty development and support. Um, and so, the, you know, the more digital, <laughs> the more complicated it gets to deliver. Excellent. And from a policy standpoint, Catherine, we've certainly seen the Department of Education. Well, they're going to bring up the whole definition of distance ed again this year in, in rulemaking. And so and there's been some calls for, you know, expanding, you know, the, the rules for distance ed into some of these uh, uh, into hybrid, high flex, into all of that. What do, you, what do you see around that or other policy implications in terms of these sort of uh, blurred lines or, or lots of hybrid? I feel like what I see is the most potential like policy implication is, is just kind of the general idea that by policy or regulation tends to lag behind innovation. So like we have these new terms like hybrid, mm -hmm. high flex, and right now we kind of just have to fit it within the bucket of distance education or not distance education or, or correspondence education. But um, there might be move or there might be like an effort to define these terms in policy but that might not always align with how the practitioners in the field want to define it. I mean, we see variation um, amongst practitioners um, who are, you know, experts in the field and, and, you know, there's still disagreement there. So when you bring in policy, it's not always going to align there. So I, I think that there will be most likely efforts to, to regulate more and define more, but it also might cause more confusion as, you know, the regulation tries to catch up with where uh, practice is currently. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, and then the uh, policy lagging regulation. And we think regulating substantive interaction came about, about in 1992, and it wasn't until uh, was it 27 years later that it got up up to, <laughs> up to, <laughs> Did anything happen between 1992 and 2019? Uh, just a little bit. Anyway, let's go to some questions from uh, uh, the folks in the audience. Uh, uh, Jim asks. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, oh no, let me yeah, let me start with Jim's. Uh, Jim asks about is Minerva subject to regular substantive interaction regulations? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to bring that up. Uh, if so, it seems like the descriptors for fully asynchronous versus fully synchronous are a little incongruous. Uh, you want to take that, James? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, Minerva University is not a Title IV institution. Um, so, but they do, they still are subject to a lot of the regulations around visas because they have over 60% international students. So um, these definitions definitely apply to them. And because the experience at Minerva University is one in which students travel internationally as part of their education, um, they've had to work very closely with uh, different uh, regulators to make sure that they meet all the requirements. But at Minerva Project, which is the, the sort of consulting and services and technology part, 
of Minerva, which is a, again totally separate separate uh, organization at this point. You know, we work with institutions globally on these definitions, and the regulations differ from country to country. So we have projects in the UK, in the UAE, in Korea, in Mexico, and all of them um, will define you know sort of online education uh, and hybrid learning and in-person learning differently and have different thresholds for whether or not a program falls into a particular category. So one of the things we've looked at is how do you create a program that can um, you know, really meet the student's audience and fall into the right category to meet the regulations um, for what the institution wants to do. And uh, it's really important because things are changing really fast. And in a few cases, this was true at Minerva University and it's been true with some of our partners. We've actually been able to enter into conversations with accreditors and other um, uh, government institutions, departments of education and so on to um, give them our perspective on, on how we think they may want to define things in order to uh, create the, the best advantage for students and for institutions. Yes, yeah, yeah, and it, it's it's very interesting. And and, and uh, there's some questions about non-credits and uh, how do the, some of these things uh, apply to that. And it, and it it's interesting that there's the for the first time in my career, I'm seeing interest by the Department of Education in what's going on in the non-credit space because of the transferability or uh, creating uh, uh, stackable credentials. You know that these eventually become credits, and so. We'll see whether anything comes of that this year and so that's something and so that may be something too that um uh, minerva may need to get into as well is that right james so yeah absolutely okay uh karen asks uh when i was talking about the uh, student services you know from our uh student group that we talked to she said is there a specific set of services that they want to want to know about and i'm trying to remember exactly what uh, what they said, but the things that 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 stick with me though is that it's it's just interesting that uh, uh, some of them didn't really know that there was tech support <laughs> uh, that that was available. Uh, you know, you would think that that would be the case, and that someone would tell them about it. But it, uh, uh, you know, sometimes the the faculty or the uh, folks who are the, who who relay these things and if they if they don't that they just assume somebody else told them that it doesn't get to them uh tutoring if you have online tutoring services they didn't always know about that that uh um one was <laughs> one student learned about online tutoring services and the availability of them in our focus group and she said i need to go look to see <laughs> whether we have that uh or not and then uh another one is that you know, we're seeing more and more in terms of uh, i talked about that uh, low income student and in terms of extra financial help or the emergency funds um, that, you know, they're, they're worried about those sorts of things and the availability to those sorts of funds to those who are at a distance isn't always, isn't always known. So those were some examples. Uh, um, let's see, I, maybe we'll move on unless somebody else has uh, something that they would like to add that they've seen, uh, Shannon or James, that where students want more with student services. We actually just held an event uh, last week at Oregon State. Uh, we called it the Think Affordable Summit. It was the first time that we've offered it, but the audience was faculty and advisors. And what we did was we pulled together a series of lightning talks about all of the different affordability resources and programs and initiatives at the university, um, just so that the, you know, the folks who students tend to reach out to when there is a need um, would be familiar with everything. So there's so much going on and so much out there. We wanted to make sure that the faculty and advisors have that information top of mind so that they could adequately refer students to, to help when it's needed. Excellent. Um, and I'll just add, Russ, uh, that uh, someone in the chat asked about orientation. And actually, we found this to be one of the key success factors in helping students to navigate hybrid programs uh, is to really get started at the beginning of a program or even sometimes at the beginning of a semester as a kind of reminder um, with some kind of session, which you know can be hosted virtually itself, uh, can be hybrid itself, or it can be in person to kind of orient them and not help them to navigate um, different formats in which their classes might be offered, um, get clear about those expectations and so on. And you know, at bigger institutions where students might be taking classes across different units and departments and so on, this is where the uniformity and, and having some consistency across those expectations and definitions can be really helpful to students. Okay. Shannon, I was going to, Dion had that question about orientation. I was going to uh, get that to you as well. And then you may want to uh, 
reflect upon what you do and then also on the uniformity thing it's a lot easier for uh, minerva or maybe a community college to do that it's a lot harder for oregon state to do it across your your colleges we do have um, an orientation for for all online students to go through and then many of our programs we also work with them to create specific program orientations um, that students go through and we do this all um, virtually through our learning management system and that it is really it's it's a great way to make sure that students are getting that just in time kind of information as they're getting started um, and and so that they're you know accessing all the different resources and and just becoming aware of what they need to be okay great 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 uh kevin asked a question this might be for you catherine about uh how do clinicals and practicums that have physical presence requirements impact defining a program, especially where the program's coursework is 100% online? Uh, does the presence uh, requirement uh, location matter uh, for on-campus versus local uh, versus students? Let's start with you from a policy standpoint and see what others are doing. And I have to tell you that it, it drives me crazy when people use the term fully online, except for the five times they have to come to campus uh so that's my that's me uh <laughs> uh it's not fully online uh but Catherine let me let me turn it to you so yeah so I think I'm not aware of anything in particular on how I can't point to one specific agency but I would imagine that when we talked about those variations of percentages like that's where you might have to start doing some some math in terms of figuring out how much of this instruction requires you know 30 hours of a clinical and like how does that calculate in terms of, of that because I would say I would it, it depends on each individual you know agency and how they interpret it but I would imagine most places would say that in, an in-person requirement such as a clinical or practicum unless it can be completed online in your home would most likely make that aspect of the course not distance education so that's when you have to get into the very specifics of of percentages uh, for example I know with iPads although this is more in relation to orientation and testing, but they specifically exclude some aspects of orientation, testing, or academic support, saying that the, those do not exclude a course from being classified as distance education. So I think it's really going to vary depending on what agency you're looking at, but expecting to have some sort of process in place to be able to, to say how you determined what percentage of the course is online versus not. And to Russ's point about fully online or online, although although those aren't really defined in policy that I've seen, at least using using those internally as an institution, you just want to be very mindful of requirements um, relating to how you communicate to students, like with misrepresentation, um, and just thinking from the student perspective, how would they define these terms? So like Russ was saying, fully online, most people would probably assume a fully online course means that you never have to leave your house. Um, so just making sure that however you define it, you clearly share that out, um, I think would be very key from a general policy and regulatory compliance perspective, um, and then having a process in place to determine what percentage online the course is. Yeah, I think requirements. being clear with students is good. Uh, Shannon, you've got some with clinicals. Do you want to reflect on that at all? Sure. I mean, uh, for us, we really try to, uh, not try to, we do uh, communicate to students at the program level. So when they're applying to a program, they're clear on what's what's required. So any programs that require any kind of um, on-campus or clinical, um, you know, presence, you know, any kind of physical presence, that's communicated to the students so that they know what to expect for the whole program. And so our, actually our faculty senate has a curriculum council that really monitors this carefully. So as new programs get proposed, um, they're verifying that if we're saying that the program is available online or in hybrid format or on campus, that all of the required components are available in all those different modalities and locations. That's one of our, just one of the processes that we use to make sure that, you know, it's, that students get what they're expecting. Okay. And Shannon, Kevin asked a follow-up of you in chat, if you could respond to that. And then I'll go to the next question and start with James uh, on this one. And that uh, this comes from Kelly. And she says she's concerned that growing hybrid will remove access for rural audiences. Uh, uh, hybrid programming efforts work well if your institutions are located in large urban 
areas. And I, and I would add to that, that, that maybe even less so in uh, some urban areas. I was just at Community College of Aurora last year and the, the bus that used to, uh, due to, at, due to post COVID, the bus that used to stop in front of the institution now stops over, uh, like a mile and a half away, which if it's a snowy or rainy day is not a fun thing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, to try to get there uh, anyway, but but your your take on that, James, in terms of uh, locality of the student. Yeah, it's really important, and this is one of the reasons why we uh, think about hybrid at the course program and institutional level. And at the institutional level, being hybrid sometimes means being able to offer the same program in different modalities for different audiences of students. Um, you know, we've seen this a lot with, for example, some graduate degrees like MBAs and things like that, where um, institutions that have been really thoughtful about this will leverage the same content and the same faculty to be able to offer their degree to an in-person audience that wants to be on campus and also those who are uh, located you know, in more remote locations. Um, really trying to maintain the same level of quality across the modalities, but of course accounting for their, their differences. And um, I think it's not the case that um, for an institution to, to be hybrid means that it has to offer all of their um, programs and courses in mixed modalities. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, you know, you can have options for students or different pathways or tracks where, you know, if they want the access to campus, they can have it. In some cases, that might mean, you know, once a month or, or a couple times a semester. And for other cases, for other students, you know, fully online is, is the right approach for them. Um, some interesting data that even those students who, who, do, who are far from campus, they want to come to campus, you know, a few times, maybe at the beginning, at the end for graduation, that sort of thing. So I think being able to create those different pathways is really powerful for institutions to be able to provide access to um, learners who have different needs. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Thank. Thanks so much. That's it's a good point. It, it, good. Good points all around. Uh, I think this may end up being our last full full question here, uh, uh, given the time that we have. But I'm going to come to uh, Shannon, if you would, and then uh, Catherine as well. But Dietrich uh, asks, do you have any? thought on the future of distance education that involves in-person or synchronous exams, uh, clinical exams, math exams that have been taught to convert to asynchronous distance. Um, and then the, for, for Catherine, any trends or expectations around federal policy shifts with that? So, so Shannon, where do you see uh, going with proctoring and in-person exams? Yeah, uh, um, over the pandemic, our university switched to um, all um, online proctoring, you know, just because we weren't able to gather students. And we've stuck with that as we've kind of come out and been able to gather again. Um, it's just worked well for us, so we've, we've moved to that. Um, but, you know, of course, there's always the hope that um, more and more assessments will become authentic and uh, maybe exams will be, you know, minimized. We won't need to rely on exams so heavily if we're doing more applied and authentic kinds of assessments. And we're AI is causing us to rethink assessment. Is that <laughs> indeed? indeed. Uh, that's for another day. Uh, that's coming up. I'll look for our future uh, webcasts on that uh, <laughs> and uh, blog posts. Uh, Catherine, you know, certainly you may want to remind people that uh, you know if you do have these sorts of uh, proctoring things, and if there's a charge that people need to uh, uh, inform students of that, but are you seeing any other trends from a federal side on on that? Um, well, as I, I mentioned earlier, we saw the, the one definition with iPads that does exclude those courses from being for distance education, but that's exclusively for the data reporting side. And I think when it comes to other compliance considerations, I think the ultimate just kind of like policy perspective to keep in mind, is, especially with this administration, is very focused on consumer protection. So as Russ mentioned, you do have those regulations that require certain information to be disclosed ahead of time um, about cost. But I think there is also more than cost. There is the access issue. So I don't know what kind of policy changes they will make or even need to make. But I expect that if if these are to become more common and they're not communicated clearly, there could be potentially some movement or shift or guidance from the department to try to make sure that institutions are that's that that is information that is being communicated clearly to students ahead of time so that they can make those decisions um, is, you know, having those predetermined times or on-campus requirements is not always something students are going to expect unless it's clearly 
mentioned to them ahead of time and it could really cause an impact in terms of them having to delay their coursework or anything if they're not able to do that. Um, so that's what I would expect just from that consumer protection standpoint is just a, a more a more closely examined look at those practices and how students are being communicated with. Yeah, and I, I too, I've not heard much in the way of trends about that other than there, there's some who are talking about doing more uh, uh, doing more with hybrid and other sorts of things. And then we'll get, we'll do a real quick thing on uh, Michael's uh, question because I see we're, we're at time, but about uh, um, he asked any thoughts on Ed's proposed amendments to the definition of distance education um, coming up in no negotiated rulemaking. The answer is no. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that, other, other that we, we don't really know. We were surprised to see that. We don't know where they're going um, with that other than there's this whole thing, you know, what we saw out of the third party services and other sorts of things. There's, there's a lot more interest in what I've alluded to before about, you know, expanding out to uh, just then what was the narrow definition of distance ed, maybe out to some hybrid and some other things. Other than that, we could be really surprised with, with what comes. So um, we will keep you informed as we hear. So, and, and that the uh, uh, the call for uh, rulemaking and what they want to look at should come out probably in April or May, we're thinking. So with that, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, great discussion, great questions, uh, great presentations. We'll turn it back to Megan. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Thank you, Shannon and James and Catherine. Great presentation. Again, all of our resources will be sent to you along with the link to the recording and the slides. And those are posted on our website as well. So if you're interested in the webcast that we do, you can always go back and view our archives. If this is your first event with us, stay tuned for more events. We have quite a bit coming up. And uh, you'll see that we have um, a few things coming up. March has been already very, very busy for us here at WCET, but we have an update on third party service guidance on March 20th, and that's with our friend Phil Hill. We have a member only closer conversation around this topic led by Catherine. And then our next webcast is going to take you on a, a website accessibility audit and we'll share the lessons that we've learned in doing that. And you are the very first people to know that we are just launching our call for proposals for the WCET annual meeting. And in conjunction will be as we, which was formerly if we, is the annual summit for women in e-learning. So you can submit a proposal for one or both but do join us in New Orleans in October. And I'd like to quickly acknowledge our sponsors that help underwrite our programs and events here at WCEP, as well as our supporting members that invest in us at a higher level because they value the good work that we do. So we are very grateful for them. Again, thank you for attending this webinar today. Thank you for your engagement and your questions. And thank you to all of our panelists. Have a great afternoon. Bye.